Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Desk.com, the all-in-one customer support app for fast-growing companies. Visit Desk.com slash twist to get your service desk up and running today for as low as $3 per month. And by MailChimp, manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month, free with MailChimp. And by AWS Activate, the Amazon Web Services Startup Program. It's easy to start and scale your business with AWS. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, our Potrepreneur episode. Yes, you heard that right. We're going to talk about medical marijuana today, and it's a booming business because in 20 states, it's now legal for medical uses, and in two states in the United States, it is now legal for recreational use. It's going to be a very large business. It's going to be legal, and so let's just talk about the entrepreneurial and the startup opportunities in medical marijuana. Stick with us. It's going to be a very, very important show. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil, but funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Again, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at Jason on Twitter. Yes, I'm showing off that I have at J-A-S-O-N on Twitter. Uh, it's nice when your friend starts Twitter and you get to have Jason. So uh, you know the show. It's This Week in Startups. If it's your first time here, you can follow us on Twitter at TWI Startups or at thisweekinstartups.com. What do we do here on the show? We talk about startups, entrepreneurship, investing in them. And as many of you know, I've been building internet companies for 20 years, hosting podcasts and conferences around it, and I've invested in 70 companies. So I'm pretty well versed on the subject, and I have a great production team here that researches what are the important topics that you know, are going on in startups and technology and investing. But we also try to look towards the future. And today is one of those future episodes. We jokingly call this our potrepreneur episode, but it's a deadly serious issue. There are people suffering all across America with different diseases, including, as you may have seen, Sanjay Gupta um, on CNN did a big report on medical marijuana, where horribly some kids were suffering from seizures. And medical marijuana actually is a, not smoking it, but just taking a very light uh, edible, um, has helped these kids tremendously. They don't get high from it. It just stops them from having seizures. It's, uh, Sanjay Gupta called it a wonder drug in these, in these things. And he actually changed his position that medical marijuana was something Sanjay Gupta from CNN, their medical correspondent, was against medical marijuana, and he flipped his position. So the United States is changing very radically in its approach to medical marijuana. And with me today are two entrepreneurs in the space, Troy Dayton and A.J. Gentile. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Okay, so just I think I laid out the basic landscape. There's 20 states where it's now legal for medical purposes, which means you have to have a doctor give you a prescription. And there's two states now, this year, correct, that now have recreational drug use. Is that correct? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, not drug well, use, recreational anyone, marijuana uh, use. Anyone 21 and over in both uh, Washington and uh, Colorado can now purchase from a store just like alcohol. Just like alcohol. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Troy, in your, in your position on this, do you believe marijuana is less dangerous or more dangerous than, say, alcohol? Oh, yeah, no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's way less dangerous than, than alcohol. And the studies prove that out, and the deaths prove that out? Yeah, all the data I, I've ever seen has suggested that. And, and, and most people just know that from their own uh, individual experience. The right? anecdotal evidence yeah. is clear. Exactly. Um, but, A.J., even in um, Europe... Uh, and specifically in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, the person who was responsible for health uh, and health administration actually got fired, presumably because he said ecstasy and marijuana, which is a different subject, but right. marijuana was less dangerous than alcohol. Um, what's your position on that in terms of alcohol versus marijuana, and, and how do you look at that issue? Completely agree. I mean, alcohol, when you look at it, even down to the molecular component, is a poison. You know, it's why it makes us feel so terrible in the morning. Hmm. Um, marijuana doesn't doesn't affect the body that way. It doesn't attack the liver that way. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have those after effects that alcohol does. And even the effects of the substance itself while you're going through the high or whatever it is, it's a, it's a completely different feeling than, than alcohol where maybe you are a little bit more erratic or a little bit more aggressive. Mm. Um, where with marijuana, you're, you're more peaceful. You have ah. less pain. You kind of, you're a little more sedentary. Got it. So um, tell me, Troy, what exactly 
do you see as the business opportunity for medical marijuana today? Well, um, uh, my company, the ArcView, uh, ArcView Group, we did a, a study through ArcView Market Research um, where we spent six months out there really talking to uh, participants and, and really doing some projections. And we said as a $1.5 billion industry, the legal cannabis industry um, in the U.S. in 2013, growing this year to $2.6 billion, which is about a 68% increase in just one year with uh, over, by 2018, a 102 billion dollar industry. So now, that's has that just increased, wholesale and retail. Yeah. Has that increased so dramatically because of the number of states who have yeah. made it legal or is consumption going up in those mm, states or both? Yeah, it's it's 100% regulatory led. Um, the, the legal market is still a tiny fraction of the total market uh, for cannabis. And so every time a state passes a law and there is now cannabis that is legally purchased, that is cannabis that is n not being, that, that's, that's a market that's now going in a regulated and taxed environment instead of um, to criminals. Now, now, what is the ARC group? Um, so the, the ARC view group, um, we do a ARC couple- view group. We yeah. do a couple, two main things that we do. One is we run uh, an investor network, the ARC view investor network, and we have over 200 accredited investors uh, that meet every quarter to kind of go over um, to, to um, kind of a uh, Shark Tank-like uh, pitch fest, which yeah, is quite angel familiar. Group. A familiar. Angel familiar. Network, sure. Exactly. So if I was uh, an entrepreneur in the space, yeah. I could come to this ArcView gathering yep. and meet 200 investors who might invest in the company. Now, what kind of companies are coming uh, to this get-together? Are they people who are selling marijuana mm -hmm. directly to consumers or people who are building technology? Who, who, what's the op business opportunity? Yeah, we see both types of companies and they actually go through a whole selection process so the only people that show up to these things are the ones that have been specially chosen to, to, pre -vetted. to do that pre-vet it yeah and uh, it's we not see, an idea competition right. these are legit entrepreneurs exactly and we have a wide range of, of, of businesses some of them are direct businesses dispensaries and um, uh, infused product manufacturers that make different sort of uh, um, preparations but then there's this whole so you mean like if somebody makes popcorn or uh, pot exactly. colas or cookies or something, that might be a product. Then exactly. you have people who are doing dispensaries. And then what are the other categories of opportunity? There's uh, so many ancillary businesses. You know, they say during a gold rush, it's a good time to be in the pick and shovel business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's true here, uh, particularly because of the regulatory differences between being in the pick and right. shovel business and being in the actual uh, plant. And so we see everything from you know, uh, point of sale companies, uh, security companies, insurance companies, um, you know, vaporizer companies, uh, you know, a whole Explain to people what a, what a vaporizer is, who do, people who don't know what that is. Um, so uh, when you combust uh, plant matter via a lighter, um, you get like smoke. But if you heat it up slowly, um, you uh, just release sort of a vapor without experiencing combustion. And that's the, you know, one of the favored ways to consume cannabis these it days. It takes out one of the most dangerous parts of consuming cannabis, which is the smoke. Correct. You're just mm -hmm. inhaling vapors. Exactly. Okay, so AJ, what is your business, um, and how is that going? When did you found it? Uh, well, we're Speedweed, speedweed.com, founded in 2011, and we are an on-demand mobile delivery service for medical marijuana. So think about Domino's Pizza. That's kind of what we are. So you're Uber for medical marijuana, in a way. In a way, yes. Okay, um, so now this seems to me uh, like people could get arrested, right? Because I, I, when I first moved out to L.A. and I sort of started hearing about this, I, you know, being a New Yorker, I was like, wow, if you have marijuana, you get arrested. Yeah. But out here in L.A., it's a, it's a much different culture. It is. And, but there must be, you're, you're pretty much pioneering this. There must be a lot of regulation, because we had, just a couple years ago, the dispensaries were getting shut down in some cases sure. by the feds. So now you have a driver bringing it to people. We do. What's the regulation there, I wonder? Well, our model is a little bit different than maybe other delivery services. We focus more on logistics and technology mm -hmm. to deliver our products. So um, what we're really doing is taking a patient who has a particular desire for a type of medication, taking a cultivator or a vendor who has that medication. They are both in our collective, and then we serve as a legal apparatus to allow them to conduct a safe transaction in their home. Got it. So you're not actually the manufacturer, distributor, or consumer of the weed, you're the delivery service. We're the delivery service. We're logistics. Um, we, we have a lot of cultivators that are part of our collective. Mm -hmm. we, we're even interested in doing our own grow operations, but our primary focus is just getting it there legally and safely. How long have you been doing this? Since 2011. 
Got so it. we're two and a half years in. Two and a half years in. Mm -hmm. And did you take investment for this business, or did you just do it you know, with your own money and seed capital? H how did you fund this business, and how is it going? What's the scale of this business today? Um, we started out, actually, uh, with a small grow. Um, my brother came out from New York. Uh, we were writing software for Congress, and we were miserable. We needed a change. Hmm. He comes out to L.A. and says, hey, there's medical marijuana here. I never heard of it. So we decided that we would set up a grow in my living room, grow some, uh, grow some marijuana, and then resell it to dispensaries and then make our fortune from there. So we spent three or four months growing marijuana in the living room, and it was a disaster. It was everything that went wrong. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So we had this weed that we couldn't sell, but, we, but, but it was very potent. Hmm. So we spent some time learning how to extract the THC and the CBD from the flowers. And then we started doing edibles. Ah. And the edibles took off. We were doing gummy bears and lollipops and some things that other folks weren't doing. Got it. And then you decided to go into the delivery business. We did. Now, is growing marijuana and then selling it to a distributor, is that an actual business? Depends on the state and depends on the regulatory environment and also depends on who your lawyer is. Yeah. Okay, so it's, yeah, because this is where we're all a little bit confused, because we right. hear that yeah. in, or what I hear is, in Northern California, uh, there's a lot of places that are growing, in towns where there were no businesses, and then yeah. all the houses, it sort of like got us a sort of breaking bad feel from the outside, mm -hmm. of like, all these abandoned houses have now been turned into grow houses, yeah. and the local police are cool with it, there's taxes going on, there's employment going on, and it's no big deal. What exactly is the state of marijuana being grown in California and the United States? Well, I think, you know, when you look at Colorado and other states that are have uh, regulated from the start, mm -hmm. um, you see a much different situation. That does not happen in the other states. And it's one of the reasons why there's a big push for regulation um, in California. It's sort of very loose. It's still kind of wild west out here. Got it. So people are growing in different towns in California. Yeah. Um, but and there they... are some places that have that have regulated uh, the the whole the whole shooting match. You know, you see like in you know San Francisco and uh, Oakland and some places have really gotten some really great regulations. Sure. You know, they have. Um, and so is that a good business? Like, how much does it cost to make an ounce or pound of marijuana? And then what would it retail for? What would the wholesaler buy it for? What, take me through the economics of. You know, this gram of marijuana gets from a farm to a consumer. That's, that is a good business if you're good at it. Um, you know, you'll hear people say, anybody can grow weed. Let's grow weed and make a zillion dollars. The, the product that we acquire and the patients that we purchase from are, they are connoisseurs, they are talented. It's, it's harder to grow good marijuana than it is to make uh, a, a wine, you know, mm. a, a nine, uh, that's going to score a 97 or a 98. It's gotcha. harder to do. So there's a, there, there are fewer people doing it. Now, as far as a business, if you can find those cultivators who have that expertise, the margins are pretty big. Um, they uh, double their money? They triple their money when they sell it from a farm to a wholesaler? I, I'm reluctant to say the actual numbers okay. because, it's, because it, it could be wildly different. Got it. And overhead is radically different. Our mm. overhead is enormous, so mm -hmm. our margins are different. Right. But if you're just a small grower, you can set up for between 50 and 100K. Uh -huh. You can grow product for up to $1,000 a pound conservatively, and that could retail for 2,500 to 3,000, depending on how. Okay, so it's not a yeah. ridiculously outrageous business, but it, oh. it has a margin just like maybe clothes have or something, where it gets marked up twice on the way to the customer. Yeah, I will say that this is a, a rare situation. I think when you look into the other um, states, what you're what you're seeing for the most part is something that's not necessarily driven by those kinds of economics, but more driven by the fact that there's limited uh, licenses. Yes. Mm. So in you know in places like um, you know Connecticut and and uh, most of the northeastern states that are changing their laws, uh, Massachusetts, these places. This is where you know people are spending a million dollars just on their application to get their license. Oh, I see. And then there's a limited number of licenses uh, for a whole host of of, uh, of 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 folks, and so it's less about your cost of production and more about the fact that there is a high barrier to entry. Um, that, but then you're basically given. Uh, a, a shocking amount of, uh, of of customers based on those limited licenses. All right, when we get back from this important uh, sponsor message, I want to ask you, uh, both of the gentlemen here, AJ and Troy, when are we going to have a Starbucks or a Merck or Pfizer uh, level brand in the marijuana space? How many right. years will it be until that when we get back yeah. from this very important message? Great. Hey everybody, it's Jason, and what a great episode we've had. My friend Layla from Desk.com is here with me, and as you know, they're a huge partner on the program. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about Desk. 
how do you deal with those like huge crises? I mean, will you have hundreds of people now, um, you know, like involved? Work because that, it's yeah. one thing that you like have uh, an issue with your Uber getting double billed. It's another thing when like, you know, everyone's up in arms. Everybody's up in arms. Yep. How do you deal with the up in arms kind of situation? You think when you decide to start a company, right. you think about what you're going to build, right? right. And how you're going to get money and all that stuff. Right. But then once you get a little bit further into the build, you think about the roadmap of what you're going to build. Mm -hmm. What people don't do is create the same support roadmap because if mm -hmm. you create that, you come up with a plan for those dramatic moments, gotcha. right? Whether it's swarming, whether it's one formal statement, whether it's everyone on deck. Like people, different companies approach it in different types of ways. But the thing, I think, the companies that get hurt in this are the ones that haven't thought about it. They think support's like, oh yeah, whatever. It's an afterthought, right? They which haven't really done it, which idea. is like kind of with Firefox where like this whole thing boiled up and they just clam up and nobody's talking. That's the worst. That in my opinion, I, I agree. I mean, how I mean, do you not even talk to your constituents? Right. Like, you have to own it. You have to. Yeah. I mean, look, we're all human. The no mistakes. one's trying to make mistakes. They right. get made. So just own it when it happens and be forthright with people. Honesty is always the best policy when it comes to support. Who do you think should be using desk.com? You know, who, who are the ideal clients that you guys uh, you guys have in there? I think Desk makes a lot of sense for companies that are, need to get support up and running fast and want to make sure they're listening and engaging on every channel, right. right? Really, any small company that's looking for a way to deeply engage with who they're trying to sell to, whatever they're selling, yeah. that was my point, it doesn't have to just be software. And it's not that expensive, right? No. No, you guys it's really not. Like a couple of dollars per seat. It much. depends. I mean, there are three. There's one that's like around fifty, one around twenty-seven-ish, and one's uh, there's a starter for three. But, but we're talking about like you put it on your credit card, it's lunch yeah. or something. And I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's like the cost of two pizzas. Pretty much. Right. Pretty so much. If you can afford two pizzas for your Friday kegger, you can afford to have. There you go. There, there you go. go. There you go. There you go. Two pizzas. Go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Listen, this has been great, Layla. You're delightful. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for James, being super honest. It. And uh, we, by the way, we love using the product, and thank you for supporting the program. All right, welcome back, and thanks to our partners. Uh, with me today, Troy Dayton uh, and AJ Gentile, two gentlemen uh, who are really have been in the space for a couple of years each year, uh, have learned a lot about medical marijuana. And when we left for the break, I had asked, I think, a question that a lot of us as investors have on our mind is, is this a Starbucks or Pfizer-like opportunity? And if so, Will we see a Starbucks of marijuana in 10 years? What mm -hmm. do you think? Yeah, I, I think that uh, national brands are already beginning. Okay. Um, and They are? Yeah, already beginning. What's the number one national brand? I've never I, heard of a national brand. I would brand. say the two biggest uh, national brands are Dixie Elixirs and Open Vape. Open um, Vape and Dixie Elixirs. Elixirs. Got yeah. It. And, uh, and uh uh, Dixie Elixirs makes infused products, Got so it. a whole wide range of different infused products. Uh, and Open Vape um, makes uh, these um, like e-cigarettes that ah, yes. have uh, this cannabis oil in it. Gotcha. And uh, both of them, I think, I mean, they're still tiny by by any kind of other comparison. And you also have challenges because in each state, you know, you can't like send your product really across state lines, so ah. they have to do like more like. Um, uh, licensing That's, agreements in each state. So gotcha. It, it, the so it is like a franchise. Scale. It's almost yeah. like a McDonald's or something. Exactly. And that's a little, that makes it a little harder to create those economies of scale. But what's most interesting, I think, about this market right now is that you've got a group of, uh, you've got a, a couple billion dollar industry that's growing very fast and no major players. There's not a single multinational company that's that's really in this. Um, and so what that it means is that it gives the little guys a chance to really go for it mm. um, in, as, as laws change and more things change. And so I think that you will see some 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 big national brands, but I also think that the end consumers of cannabis tend to be a pretty con uh, connoisseur culture. Yeah, and so, it is like wine. I mean, yeah. the AJ, that was a very good analogy before or a because, uh, or or a micro brew, yeah, or a micro exactly. brew, mm -hmm. or maybe even a cigar company. Mm -hmm. When I first moved out here, it was I was kind of shocked being a New Yorker coming out here in the last 10 years, I'm speaking of Los Angeles, where people were discussing it, and I would walk into a discussion, and people were talking about their chem diesel, this, grape, whatever, right. apes, I don't know, and they, they really were talking about it in a, in a flavor profile or a high profile oh, yeah. kind sure. of way. Um, will we see, when will we see a major company uh, sort of get involved in this? Have you heard of a major company 
And when I say major, like a brand that, you know, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 million Americans already use or know of, sort of dip their toe in here. Is Marlboro or like those kind of companies, or you think they're looking at this and waiting for the right moment to enter? Because it seems like tobacco is going all the way down. I would think it would be a very natural thing for people who make tobacco and cigarettes to make uh, marijuana cigarettes. You know, I I think it's a difficult choice for them. You know, they have to be looking at it. Just yeah. just the revenue speaks for itself. But you know, big publicly traded companies, it, until the federal laws change, I don't think they're touching it. I really don't. I don't even think they're even st- researching. You don't think they're even like they're, monitoring? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so they're yeah. collecting uh, intelligence. So what absolutely. do you know about that, Troy? Tell me. Um, you must yes. have. Don't tell me the company, obviously, right, but be sure. really honest with me now and yeah. tell me what's going on on the back scenes. It, it, do you do there, like there Marlboro are, executives or those those type of executives come to and sneak into your, you know? I don't think uh, you groups? know. I think I don't think the tobacco companies per se are really the most likely uh, candidates. I think it's why not? Other why people. not? Because to me that seems like a natural, and they already are like in terms of moral high ground. Right. The fact is the, the the cigarette companies have killed. You know, hundreds of millions of people, and they have absolutely no morals. So, right, which is exactly why we don't want them. Right, exactly. (laughs) I'm just saying you don't want them. But why? Um, Why are they not in there? um, I would think because of just from their standpoint, they just so much of a PR challenge Ah, that mm -hmm. they deal with already. Mm -hmm. I think actually, what's more likely is is other types of companies, companies that are in the logistics business of moving Ah. things, people who are in the businesses of of uh, dealing in. uh, industries that have limited licenses for things. Got it. Right? Oh, so limited Those licenses. Are There's a much tip. more interesting. So a limited license business might include alcohol or gambling. So do you think casino companies or uh, people who produce alcohol might be more interested in this? Sure. I mean, I think anybody that's in business is going to be interested in this. But And I think that those companies are definitely looking at this. Look, there's yeah. someday in the near future, uh, 10 years from now, there's going to be entire floors in, on Wall Street dedicated to analyzing this industry. Gotcha. And the smart people who are really th- are looking at that right now and trying to figure out how they uh, What's the most likely either specific company or a group of companies that will get into this space? Is the coffee bean and tea leave, you know, a local Los Angeles-based company, could you see them actually taking an approach like Amsterdam and saying, <laughs> hey, we're coffee bean and tea leaf yeah. and, you know, marijuana leaf? Sure. Well, I mean, it's interesting. I, I was uh, I was doing a, um, a, 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 a like a panel discussion with uh, John Mackey uh, mm. from Whole Foods years ago. Ah, and Whole he, Foods. And yeah. he uh, uh, and someone from the audience asked, you know, if if cannabis were legal, would would Whole Foods um, uh, have it? And he's like, yeah. He's like, he gave a whole explanation about where he would see it in Whole Foods and really you know, the whole the whole thing. Where, and, where where would it be in Whole Foods? Like it would be between the like soaps and deodorants and the right, vitamins. Right, I right. don't know. Yeah, no, it would be like in the bulk food section yeah. or in near the near the specialty cheeses <laughs> in the wines. So AJ, uh, chime in here. Um, you know what I've, I'm finding interesting is we're starting to see a lot of large produce manufacturers start to dip their yeah. toe in the water. Ah, That's common, yeah. you know, produce manufacturers. Are, Very interesting. Who are, so who are considering turning large facilities over that do microgreens. Gotcha. Yeah, that's much more likely. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen a lot ah, of that. So Chiquita Banana, but maybe not sure. them specifically, yeah. but somebody who already has massive food production going yeah, on, right. and they're thinking, wow, what, what can I make per acre here, 19-cent bananas or 15-cent mm-hmm. exactly. apples? This could be a little bit more profitable. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think that the most likely big companies to get into this are not going to get into the direct business. They're actually going to start buying up the ancillary businesses first. So the ah. software companies, the point of sale companies, the security companies, because right now those companies, AJ's company, right? AJ's yeah. great example, right? Yeah. Uber or something like that yeah. could you know purchase purchase Speedweed, right? Right. right. Um, and so there's that I think is the most likely scenario because what you've got. Let's take security for example. Okay, we got a company that pitched Arcview, uh, a Canna Security America, raised a bunch of money. They're sort of the ADT of cannabis, um, and they, the reason why ADT isn't in this right now is because they fear reputational risk. The market's not big enough for them. Right, so they're going to come know. in early and put in the alarm systems and security systems for growers and dispensaries. Exactly. Got it. And so, but when they get when they decide it's big enough to bother with, they're going to come in and it's still going to be a really idiosyncratic market that these other players will have already sort of eaten up. Uh, and there, I think those, that's what makes, from an investment standpoint, I think that's where a lot of these folks see themselves as particularly good acquisition targets sure. in the ancillary side. AJ, have you gone into the two markets where it's now recreationally legal? I guess that's Washington and Colorado yet. And what's the market developing like there? I'm sure you're monitoring it. We are. Um, 
we are focusing right now we're raising money so uh, what we're trying to do is focus on California because we're, we're legal here. We've got all our paperwork to do everything we need to do in California. We want to master California before we cross those state lines. However, we are setting up partnerships in those states that will maybe allow us to become the E24 of that particular city, um, just handling logistics, letting them use some of our brand identity, which is, which is growing, and, uh, and our expertise in delivery and helping them get their product out maybe to a larger base. Um, or the margins will be small on that, but that's okay. We care more about brand recognition and market share. And what has been the activity in those two markets, Troy? Because we saw, you know, we mm -hmm. we saw people on TV lining up, and you know, but uh, from what I understand, it actually hasn't been like a free for all where like everybody in Colorado or Washington is just stoned yeah. laying in the middle of the street. It's been has it yeah. been kind of muted? That's the approach. Uh, I, that's the that's the information I have. Is that it's a very muted response. It's not like everybody's like, oh my god, marijuana is legal. Let's all just leave our jobs and get high all day. It is, a, you know, for all the great headlines, it's an awfully mundane thing because it's not like cannabis didn't exist before it was right. legal. Right. <laughs> so it, it's not like a bunch of people are being induced into you know cannabis craziness. Yeah. But it, the just... sales, I, I kind of got the idea from some of this stuff that the sales were maybe disappointing to people in the first couple of months. You no, know? it was the, actually the first month blew everybody's wildest expectations. Do you know what it was? Since, or... uh, off the top of my head, I don't. But, okay, Gina, but, maybe we'll look it up as we go. But we can, we can get you those numbers from yeah, yeah. Arc V Market Gina Research. will pull it up yeah. in a second. Um, the number was over a million on day one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, although it depends on how you're looking right, at it. Right. A lot of the people are throwing out numbers because the are. media just wants a number. Got right. it. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but, uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, it's not the biggest deal. Also, you have to remember that Colorado had a very well-regulated medical cannabis market for ah. a long time prior. So it wasn't like people who wanted access couldn't get access prior to it. Well, but so that's just, the case across the whole country. Is there right. a single place where people can't get access to cannabis? That's half no, the reason why not. people want to legalize it. Yeah, <laughs> but the there there certainly is a contingent of people sure. who would not go to Washington Square Park to score weed. Sure. Fair enough. You know, in yeah. the '80s, but they would go to Whole Foods. Sure. Or actually, yeah, here exactly. in LA, we have something called the pharmacy with a yeah, yeah. with an PH or yeah, very familiar. Or with F, whatever. Yeah, anyway, nice the pharmacy. Yeah, it's a shop. beautiful shop right across from Whole Foods here in Westwood. Well, um, Normal did a study that uh, before legalization, they estimated that all, up to 60% of Americans were using marijuana on at least a once every other month basis. And then they did a very recent study, and it was 6% of, of, of Americans are using marijuana on an every other month basis. It so was, one in 20. Right. We, we, were, we were smoking weed before, and we're smoking it now. Yeah. What do you, what do you, when, if this all becomes legal, who loses? Who is the loser in all this? The, um, I mean, the cartels. Yep. Pretty much the only big Wh loser. Which cartels? Oh, like the, 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 the big international cartels that are selling... Drug um, cartels. Drug cartels, yeah. Like in Mexico or yeah. South America or whatever, they're bringing yeah. stuff over the border. Yeah. Or I also tunnels. think the other people that, that, that sort of lose, but not really, would be like, you know, a lot of w w what the cannabis that's being consumed and grown in the U.S. today illegally is being grown, you know, in people's basements. Uh -huh. uh, and so you've got people who, you know, in their spare time make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. That's not going to stick around. No. Um, but the, but they're doing that, in, you know. But they also run the risk of going to prison every day that they get up, and so they're 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 sort of making money off of sort of this inflated um, thing. So that's that's going to go away. Producer Gina uh, just chimed in on the chat room, said there was fourteen million dollars in first month sales in Colorado. So this tax is going to be a lot of tax on this, huh, AJ? Especially well, in Colorado. Yeah. yeah. So what what will this do for society? If it's taxed, you know, to the level of alcohol, is this going to solve a lot of budget problems? And is that driving, do you think, the acceptance on a on a city, state, you know, local level? Well, and now now I have to tread carefully on my political answers because yes. you know, more revenue doesn't seem to solve very many problems. Okay. Uh, regardless, um, you know, when you look at the lotto or or the sin taxes, uh, are they solving more problems? I I, I don't think so. Um, it, you know, I, I don't know what, what could really happen there until there's a little bit more standardization about what the taxes are going to be state to state and, and how we're going to allocate those funds. Mm -hmm. When you look at Colorado, where taxes can be upward of 30 percent, and then you look at Nevada, which is really doing a great job, and the taxes are somewhere in the 2 to 4 or 5 percent range. Mm -hmm. um, it, so it's going to be market driven. Gotcha. So each yeah. municipality may do it at a different level. Yeah. Um, 
I, it seems to me, Troy, like this is an amazing opportunity to have a very high tax rate on this, like we have on smoking or alcohol, mm -hmm. 100%, 50%, some number like that, that makes it incredibly palatable for the people who maybe don't agree with marijuana use or alcohol use. Yeah. But it seems like society got used to alcohol use, the people who don't drink, because, hey, at least it's taxed and regulated and people are not dying from moonshine. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think that there's a, it, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, right? You don't want to go too high or else then you can't compete with the criminal market. Right. At the same time, you know, it's pretty rare that you have an industry that's sort of begging to be taxed and regulated, right. but that's what this industry is doing. All right, when we get back, uh, I want to talk about other investment opportunities and we're going to look at some of the products and actual startups in the space. And let me take a moment to thank my good friends at MailChimp. <laughs> MailChimp is fantastic, and I have to say one of the things I'm loving about MailChimp, and you guys know I've been using MailChimp for, God, five, six, seven years, and I run, literally run, my businesses on MailChimp, and I, I actually attribute a lot of my success not only in my businesses, but as like an individual to MailChimp, because when I stopped blogging, listen, I was like the king of the blogs, man. I, I ran a blog company. But when I moved my writing to email and I started sending it, and when I started, my first email went out to like 100 close friends. It grew to 40,000 people eventually. And I really built my reputation over the last decade through MailChimp sending notes to my friends. And then people stop me on the street and say, Jason, I read your email newsletter. It was amazing. God, you got me thinking about this issue or that issue. And it built incredibly tight bonds to the level of where I may get a thousand or 2000 people respond to an email I send. This has built my personal brand and it will build your company's brand, whether it's a small company or a large company or your brand itself. Email is the most effective way to communicate with your customers, your audience, your constituents, your partners. Everybody talks about social media. Let me tell you something. On social media, they're not your users. You're borrowing them. You're leasing them. Whether it's from Facebook or Twitter, you know, as much as we all love those services, you can't be guaranteed that you're going to reach them. I can tell you, the launch ticker and a lot of these other services that I'm doing, they reach, we get open rates, 40, 50, 60 percent. I know that everybody's reading what I write. It's amazing for us. It's transformative. And really, it's the power of MailChimp that has uh, made it so easy for my team to do it. 12,000 emails free per month, and they just released MailChimp 9.2, drag and drop email designs that create mobile-friendly mobile, mobile friendly emails. And this is critical, because we tried to do this ourselves. We tried to make mobile templates for email, because and now everybody opens their emails on their Android. Maybe they're using Mailbox. Maybe they're using the mail client from you know, Apple, which is kind of dicey. Maybe they're using uh, Mailbox or Gmail. It's a complete disaster, and I couldn't figure it out. The people at MailChimp, they got incredible designers and developers over there. They figured it all out. They solved all of our problems. Uh, and it's not like they ra they charge us more money. They keep actually keeping the rates lower and even um, reducing them over time and giving more free stuff away. There is no contract, no trial, and the free plan is always free. Don't let yourself be taken by those people who try to get you to sign up for a one, two, three, four-year contract. That's nonsense. MailChimp would never do it. And you get up to 2,000 subscribers uh, for free as well with that 12,000 uh, email per month plan. Oh, and the thing I was forgot to tell you about, Twitter now has something called Twitter cards. You can set up a Twitter card where you tweet, and then it says, join my mailing list. And with one click on Twitter, somebody can join your mailing list. It takes whatever email they started up with Twitter and puts it on your MailChimp list. So we just set this up. We put out a Twitter ad, so instead of putting a Twitter ad out that just goes to a link, we're just like, screw it. Let's put a Twitter ad out that just says, join our email list to get more information about This Week in Startups or the launch ticker or my missives. And it's amazing. Every time we tweet, we get a couple of dozen, you know, five, 10, 20 emails. Those emails are worth literally four, five, six, seven dollars. So thanks again to my good friends at MailChimp, one of the longest running sponsors on This Week in Startups. I love you guys over there. Thank you so much for supporting me for so many years. Okay. <sighs> Let's go to the Bing launch of the week. Bing, bing, bing. Opening graphic. Thanks so much to Bing for sponsoring the launch of the week where we look at amazing startups launching stuff. And this week, uh, it's going to be marijuana related because we're talking about this burgeoning industry. And like this is gonna, I think this episode will go down in history, much like our Bitcoin episode, which came out four or five years before anybody knew what Bitcoin was. I mean, people know what marijuana is, but I don't think they understand <laughs> how big this industry is. So here is our first one. It's called the Fire Firefly Vaporizer. Let's play the video of this. So this is well, a there device are not many parts to that this one. instead of smoking a joint, like a cigarette, 
and putting all that smoke into your system, you can simply use a vaporizer like the Firefly vaporizer, which is sold for $270. And I guess he's powering it on here. It kind of looks like a phone. I mean, it looks like a flip cam. That's, I guess, where you smoke it from. And somewhere in here is a battery, I guess, that's heating it up. Um, and I guess he's going to undo the battery there. Um, and it looks like a Nokia phone. And somewhere in there, you put your cannabis. Um, he hasn't shown that yet. Um, but it looks like something out of the Apple store. I mean, I think the designers here are looking to make it look like an Apple product. Very interesting. Okay, next up is the Mydex chemical tester. Now, this is $399. It's a very small device. And you put a sample of something in it, right? So let's play this video. And an analysis is given to you in an app on your phone uh, to check out the potency of chemicals in the device. So here in the video, they're putting a sample of a piece of fruit, I guess, or a, or a vegetable or something, and it's giving you the chemical breakdown of that item. Now, I think the reason in this they're using it on kale and <laughs> organic vegetables and having children in the videos is because maybe they're not talking about the medical marijuana case with the product, but um, certainly that is... Um, going to be the primary use, I believe, because people feel pretty comfortable eating vegetables at Whole Foods. Okay, and third, a pot vending machine, or I should say, I, do, you guys, do you guys get offended when people call it pot or weed? I mean, you're called speedweed, so I guess not, but should we be calling it marijuana or cannabis to sort of take away the stigma, do you think, Troy? I, I prefer cannabis, You prefer cannabis. whatever people say is fine. Yeah, and you don't mind calling it weed, it's, no. it's fine. No, we all try to be real as well. Yeah, okay, so here we go, a pot vending machine in Vancouver. Uh, inside a medical dispensary, of course. It's not uh, outside the medical dispensary. You put your cash in, and then you pick your weed, and then this guy comes out with these incredible s glasses on and that spiked hair. Hey, look, is this guy? I think that this is the guy. I think I saw this guy on the Jersey Shore. Um, but here he goes. He's uh, going to get somebody to use his dispensary. I mean, it looks like she's going to go buy um, some potato chips or something. Uh, cute little wave to the screen. She puts in her ticket. Oh, I see. So she bought the ticket from the counter. Now she puts in these uh, special, those weren't dollar bills, or some sort of certificates with a hologram on them. And then I guess she can pick her cannabis from the machine and not bother guy at the front desk. Seems a little silly, but I guess it's a bridge until you could put these on a subway station or out on the street. All right, those are our three launches of the week. Let me have um, my two guests here, AJ and Troy. Uh, take me through each one. The Firefly Vaporizer, what are your thoughts on that, AJ? Walk me through it. Well, you have to remember, I'm coming from these products as a retailer that uh, deals with customers that want product on demand, and the price point at 279 is going to be a little bit high for my customers. Yep. We have offered vaporizers in the past, mm -hmm. and we have never been impressed with a product's reliability. Ah, the PAX you're referring to is the one that a friend of mine designed, actually, I can't say who, but... Um, that, that's a, and a friend of mine invested in the PAX one, um, and yeah, there have been a lot of pro. I don't know if you're saying that one, but I can say that because I know my friend invested in. Everybody's returning them because they keep breaking. They keep breaking. Yeah, so that's a problem. And what do you think it costs to make the PAX or or this Firefly vaporizer? Um, that, Fifty bucks, twenty five bucks. That's probably ten dollars, I would bet. So they made it for ten. They're selling that, it for I'm, three hundred. Right now, we're trying to source our own uh, disposable vape product, hmm. and a disposable one, yeah. disposable one, because we've had good success with those. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, we've been wholesaling, buying those wholesale for twenty, twenty-five, thirty dollars from China or something. Yeah. From local distributors, local distributors who bring them in from China, or right? Yeah. And we're finding them on China for a dollar, dollar and a quarter. Oh, so they're selling them in Shenzhen on the in the street fairs, red buck. They are. Uh, what, what do you think, Troy, of the uh, yeah. of the Firefly like high end Apple like PAX like uh, vaporizer two seven? Yeah, there's a couple entrants into this space, uh, and the idea is to have something that hits immediately that's really high end, and there is a market for these sorts of things. Um, I have not gotten a chance to use the Firefly. Yeah. I know some of the guys that have uh, put it together; they seem really sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if they're if the, that that it's probably uh, going to do well. My guess is that they'll have to drop the price. Assuming it works, they'll have to drop the price over time. Hmm. Um, a, a similar uh, company, Uptoke, uh, mm -hmm. pitched uh, ArcView and has done really has had a lot of success. What's their price point? I think they're similar price point. Two fifty, three hundred. Um, and uh, and they'll they'll be launching there soon. And so I think there's a th this is a, a a new category that's interesting. Yeah. But I think you know part of it is that I think it brings a lot of credibility to the cannabis. Uh, world to have Why? these products out there. Why does that do that? Uh, because it shows that it's serious and high tech, and Got I it. think that's important. I designed think well. Designed well. You know, mo if you go to any like 
shop and look at the vaporizers that are out right now. I mean, any of the portable ones and most of them, I mean, they look like they were put together in somebody's garage. And so it's yeah. nice that there's real it's top ends. To join up. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Next up is the Mydex chemical tester. Now, what did you guys think of this, AJ? I mean, it, it seems logical that somebody should be testing the product. I'm, sur I'm sure your dispensary is tested all the time. But are, do consumers want to test it? I, I, do, I think they do. Again, it's about price point. I oh. love that product. Oh, you, that pro you've seen it? or No, I oh, love that idea for the that idea product. For that and, if, and if that worked, we would purchase that in-house. Mm. Um, mm. We're actually acquiring a lab right now just so we can test that, all of our product in-house. Um, I don't know a unit that size if it's going to give the full spectrum of results that we need, mm -hmm. you know, which is not which is not just pesticides and THC content. We need to see specific turpentines and different compounds, ah. and we need to see all of that. What, when you see all those different compounds, is it give a profile of what the person's experience will be like? Can you correlate, in other words, the chemical breakdown of cannabis and then correlate it to how somebody would feel after consuming the cannabis? We scientists believe that you can, and there's a great company called Ebu that's trying to do exactly that. Ah, trying Ebu, to isolate, yeah. yeah, called Ebu. E B U. Um, e B B U. Mm -hmm. E B B U. We'll yeah, pull it up on the screen. Another here. Arc View company. Yeah. Oh yeah. And if they could figure out that science, and and I think they can, that's going to be an excellent product, and we would carry all of those. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. What did you think of the MyDex? Yeah. So they pitched ArcView and have raised capital uh, via our via our. What kind? What kind of uh, capital do you think? Without giving MyDex's raise away, but a Firefly, a MyDex, these kind of things. What kind of capital would these type of companies, not those specific ones, raise, and at what valuation? Um, you know, it really runs the gamut. My guess is that somewhere that those are companies that are raising in the two to five million dollar range. Um, wow, that much. I mean, I, I, that's what their goals are. Right? Okay. Yeah, I would. But imagine. maybe they've raised how much in their angel rounds? Half a million, a million? Tough, tough to say. I mean, yeah. right now, everything changed in the last few months. Okay, there's a lot of capital at the table right now. And really? Not a lot of, uh, not a lot of great companies to put it in. So the companies that are good are getting valued pretty highly. Is this highly. capital coming? Who, who is this capital? Who, who is it? High it, net worth it, individuals, it, yeah. or do you have guys like me or gals like you know? Yeah, the high like net me? worth people <laughs> like me, who are professional angel investors who not only invest their own money but other people's and venture yes. capitals. Are they coming yet? Yes, both. We don't have any institutional capital that's shown up really yet. I mean, they're looking, but they're not not like in it. But we certainly have venture capital funds. We certainly have family Has offices. A, we certainly have um, uh, high net worth individuals. A number of billionaires are are up in this. A number of tech folks. And has a venture capital firm we know publicly made an investment or privately made an investment that you know um, of? Uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if you would consider uh, them a venture capital firm, but Duchess Capital is pretty, uh, pretty huh. prolific. They've they've invested in a number of companies and they've been public about that, as well as um, you know. Then there's ones that are specific around um, uh, cannabis, like Privateer and Ghost Group and some of these others. Um, yeah, somebody uh, did raise an, a fund around marijuana, yes, yeah. right? So there's a couple of those. What are those called? Yeah, oh, there, there's. There's uh, now dozens of them. There's dozens of firms yeah. around the marijuana opportunity. Absolutely, and they all—they that's why we started ArcView, so yeah. that all these people could play on that on that space. But my DX, I think, is interesting. You do think because, it's interesting, okay? Um, because at the end of the day, like people want to have—it's a great relative measure, hmm. right? And so, part of what what I think is interesting is that when you're a cultivator, for example, hmm. one of the applications for this is that you don't know when it's the best time to harvest. People only guess ah. that it's the right time to harvest. And you can't pay to have your cannabis sent off to a uh, mass spectrum. You know, you'd right. like to do all that each time, that wouldn't be the right time. Yeah, but time. If, you, if, you did, if you did plant them like one day apart and right. you had 30 different days, you could be testing it every day and figuring exactly. out what the sweet spot is. Oh, day 17, right. based on the earth and the moon and the yeah. sun and the water and whatever. I do question the... That uh, that many consumers, they I don't believe. I think only your highest tech consumer is going to consume right. this. Going to going to going to use my DX. But I think that retailers um, and distributors and um, and cultivators are definitely going to not leave home with something like that if it works. I All think right, they need it because the consumers are going to want to trust the retailers they're yeah, working exactly. with. Exactly, it's a they... trust but verify right. way of doing things. We're yeah. going off on a little tangent here, but I think it's an important one, which is. What is the chemical breakdown? I mean, I don't know if you're a chemist or not, but what is the chemical breakdown of marijuana? I hear THC, and then there's some other... Then there's CBD. CBD. Yeah. Um, and what are those, and why do they matter? So THC is a, a compound that's taken typically between 10 and 25, even 30% of, of the marijuana you're smoking. THC is the psychoactive compound. 
CBD is non-psychoactive. That is the compound that gives you the pain relief, and ah. it's an anxiolytic, so it calms you down. And that's why you're seeing the pharmaceutical companies focus on CBD-only products and trying to remove the THC. The from pharmaceutical the companies are looking at that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, G GW Pharmaceuticals, a, oh, publicly yeah. traded. Um, but they can't yeah. patent it, so aren't they like, oh, we can't control CBD? Oh, they, they, can, like, they can. They can. They can. They they're fast tracked through the FDA right now. But they, so, their formula. Their oh, formula. their formula right. of it, right? So they could block other people on their specific sure. formula. Right. Yeah. Of it, but CBD, because I remember when I was watching this Sanjay Gupta, yeah. you know, marijuana thing, and I'm sure you both saw mm -hmm. it. What would you guys think of that, first of all? It was great. It was, it was huge. It was yeah. huge. Was it, was it a watermark? Because it felt like that. Absolutely. Yeah. made a huge change. I mean, Sanjay Gupta is the most well-respected. He's America's doctor. Yeah. And, and, and for him to, not, not just for him to come out with something positive, but for him to change his mind. Mm -hmm. And not only change his mind, but then they just did another one another hour-long special where he went even further and said that he's doubling down. Yeah, you know, I did see that, know? yeah. And it's, so it's, it's, really, it's, it's really great affirmation of what we're, what we're Yeah, I mean, a cynic might say he did that for ratings, but you, if you watch it, you could see he very clear, yeah. clearly is not only... He's very passionate about this issue, yeah. and I think the CBD is something... That's why this is probably a really good detour for us to take, that people don't understand that that was the specific now it's coming back to my memory the people who the, these poor kids who were having 30 seizures a day and this yes. poor yeah. parent had their child doing 30 seizures a day and couldn't get the cbd mm -hmm. and he that was the one who confronted governor christie who then basically reversed his position on just this thing right but those poor parents had to move their whole families to colorado mm -hmm. just to have access to the cbd which does not make you high it doesn't it does not make you high which is better for you, to take a CBD for pain or anxiety or, you know, taking um, Motrin or whatever that is uh, that makes you, uh, you know, the painkillers? You know, it's hard to answer that question, yeah. but um, if, if you have a, 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 an acre of pain and you take a Motrin, that's going to last for an hour or two and make you feel great. Yeah, ibuprofen is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, okay, so that would work. CBD... You, you want to be careful. That could last in your system for a good long time. It could four, six, eight, twelve hours, ah. which is great for patients who are suffering suffering through cancer or other right. very painful therapies. So I, I kind of like this idea because I get sometimes knee pain from working out. I had a meniscus tear, mm. and so instead of taking like now I take ibuprofen sometime when my mm. knees are swelling up, um, or I go in my pool or I ice them, but. I could take this and not take the ibuprofen, possibly. Yeah, it really everybody's different, and yeah. we want to make sure that everybody has You're access not to all advice. of the choices, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but also, one thing to keep in mind about the CBD thing is that um, it, it tends to work best in conjunction with THC ah. and with whole plant sort of uh, mm -hmm. derivatives. And so there's there's been this rash of laws being passed around the country of CBD only laws. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's a way for these politicians to triangulate uh, mm -hmm. and and you know say that they're oh the, but I don't I want these kids but the reality is is that you know most of those families are not like so after... just being straight up CBD. There's a it's about having a ratio and it's called an entourage effect, which actually uh, Sanjay Gupta talked about in his do you, piece. Do you know why that? THC CBD combination is better, or does do scientists know that yet? I couldn't really answer that. Yeah. I'm sure there are people that I, I, if I tried to take a stab at it, I'd probably yeah. just not do Interesting. a good job. Interesting. Are there other chemicals now in THC or CBD that we should know about like when we talk about this Mydex? You know, like what else should a person know about the chemical makeup of marijuana? I mean, that, that's really the only compound you want to look at uh, when you're analyzing uh, lab results. What we're really looking at is to make sure that there's no pesticides or any garbage ah, in there. Right. Gotcha. Um, which is another reason to use the, my, my, my DX if it... Right. Yeah. Gotcha. And which is why we want to see more labs popping up around the country, because mm -hmm. that sort of will force the bad companies out. And the ah, good, So and there the, are people who are like, just cutthroat about it. Like, hey, if I can get a, a better harvest, I'll use any chemical I can. And yeah, then right. there's a bunch of the organic people who are like, hey, we're not going to use pesticide. But then they get penalized by not getting yep. as good of a harvest. And so more regulation, again, is better. And y all the potrepreneurs, yeah. to use our little buzzword, they're in favor of regulation. They are, for the most part, yeah. Yeah. 
Is there a regulation you guys don't well, when want? you're choosing between jail and regulation, <laughs> I guess regulation so. It's a low great. benchmark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, okay, now let's get to our third one here. The pot vending machine uh, in Vancouver. Seems like you might be interested in this since you're interested in the, the last mile. Is this something you've researched? What do you think of it? Um, I am not a fan of the vending machines. Why? Um, but, but remember, I come from an L.A. market where mm -hmm. there are dispensaries on every corner. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need those. I'm concerned about products staying fresh in there. Ah. Um, I don't know how that's being maintained, but uh, flowers really sh are they only flowers are only on the speedweed.com menu for a day or two. That ah. and that's it. And then we take those down. Edibles could have a shelf life of 24 48 hours. Hmm. I mean, so uh, are there going to be guys doing Coca-Cola routes refilling these? I, I just yeah. don't see it working in LA. Another market maybe. What do you yeah. think this I, I, gimmick? I, I would agree it's a gimmick. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think that um, that vending machines really okay. have a place. All right, so now we do the voting. Um, the pot vending machine, clearly you guys didn't like. Which one was your number one, which one was your number two, and why? Um, well, I'm a little biased. Okay, like, Since okay I really biased. know the guys from my DX, <laughs> I really think they're great. Um, okay. And I know a lot of our investors are invested in them, and I think right. it's a really cool But you're product. not invested in it? No, not Do personally. you invest in these, or you just host the forums? No, we host the forums. Got it. All right, AJ, what do you, which one is your favorite out of these My two? My DX, I like yeah, it. Yeah, okay. So My DX wins the um, startup launch of the week, and uh, thanks to our friends at Bing uh, for being so awesome in uh, sponsoring us and supporting us. And uh, by the way, here is the – talk about something cool. Pull up on my screen here. You can actually go to Bing, search for videos, and if you type in Vaporizer Review – you can see a bunch of folks actually testing all of these vaporizers. And uh, one of the things I love about Bing is that you get these video previews. So before you click on it, you just hover over it and it plays a little preview of what you're about to watch. Super cool. Uh, and thanks to our friends at Bing. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying that Bing endorses or doesn't endorse uh, medical marijuana or not. They're well, just supporters of the program. Um, all right. Let's talk about the future here. Um, There's so many ways to go with this, and if we – let me ask it this way. In 10 years, where will we be, AJ? I th in 10 years. 10 years. So right now it's 2014. In the spring of 2024, yeah. 2024, all of us will be in our 50s or 60s, I'm yep. guessing. And so when we're in our 50s and 60s, what is this going to look like? This is, is going to be 100% legal recreationally with with some fairly strict regulations. Okay. That's, that's my prediction. Across the entire United States? 50 states. You go to a gas station and it's there or no? I don't think so. Okay. I, I think the regulation is going to be pretty heavy, even even more, even heavier than, than a liquor store. Got it. So it will be a dedicated dispensary. Um, I think so. Uh, maybe there will be trusted brands behind a glass case in a Rite Aid or something like that. Ah, got it. Um, but Just like you can get cigarettes in a Rite Aid or right. something, but it's going to be locked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Troy, 10 years from now, where will we yeah. be? Well, I think uh, in 2018 or 2019, the U.S. Congress is probably going to pass a law that allows each state to do what it wants. Why um, did you pick that year? Is there something with presidential elections? Or? Yeah, well, it's also about the states that are going to pass. We were going to have Alaska and Oregon uh, this year, maybe Rhode Island, maybe... Pass know, recreational. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and then in 2016, we'll probably have seven or eight states uh, on the ballot for legalization for adult use. Uh, and so that'll start to build the pressure. Uh, and I think, you know, I serve on the board of the Marijuana Policy Project, and we just look at all of this stuff. And I, I think that, that the... the that's probably the year when it'll happen. Mm. Um, and then the states will each do their own thing, and most of them will wind up uh, uh, making it legal. And over this time frame, too, we'll start to see other countries. Uruguay just legalized cannabis. I did I see think that, yeah. Spain is, is, is close. Israel is close. I think, uh, you know, you'll start to see it. Canada is close, right? So I think you'll start to see that. And so I think by 2025, um, I would think that there that that this will have maybe died off as an issue, and there'll be a few of the most stringent countries in the in the world that still uh, prohibit use. And I also think that there will be a cornucopia of of medicines uh, that are based on on cannabis, uh, not just the, the the normal usage. How do we? This is a super important issue, I'm sure, for everybody involved. How do we keep kids? from consuming this because their brains are still developing. And like alcohol, alcohol or marijuana are just terrible things for a developing child's brain. H how do we make sure that this, I mean, doesn't get in the hands of kids? Well, 
one of the things that, that Speedweed is doing is we're starting a nonprofit called BAAD.org, which is Businesses Against Altered Driving. And I think we, as the newer businesses and the, the leaders in the industry, need to have that social responsibility. Businesses mm -hmm. Against Altered, altered driver. drivers, which means a driver who's under the influence of marijuana, not alcohol. Right. So it's just constantly educating the marketplace. Like, yeah, we believe in the freedom for you to purchase this, but remember, this is an intoxicant, and you got to be careful. And all of our packaging says consume responsibly and so forth. Keeping it out of the hands of the out of kids, uh, you know, that's that's the that's the parents' responsibility, and we have to give them the tools they need to educate the kids and keep it out of their hands. One thing I heard is the edibles are causing a little bit of a, a problem because people who are consuming edibles might leave edibles out. And so we have this whole series of, oh my God, a you know, toddler or, yep. or a 10 year old ate a brownie, didn't know it, or a dog. And so I've been seeing these headlines. Mm -hmm. we, we do see those headlines around alcohol as well. We do. Um, is that a major issue for the edibles market? Well, one of the things that we contended with when we first started was when your packaging looks too cute, where mm -hmm. it looks too much like a like a goodie, like a gummy bear, you're saying before you made it. Right, right. So, so we do sell gummy bears, and they're a great seller. But our packaging looks medicinal. Got um, it. But there there were companies selling Rice Krispie treats that looked just like Rice Krispie treats, and kids yeah. didn't know the difference between that and and what 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 something. Well, here we have was. it on the screen. Like so, the cannabis Nutella, and I don't yeah. know if this is your side or somebody else's. Yep. Um, but they need to be wrapped in something other than what the product looks like because. Right. Oh my goodness, you know, if these gummy bears are around my house, my daughter is going to demolish them. Right, and these are marketing pictures. If you get that at home, that's actually covered with warning labels and all kinds of stuff. Right, absolutely. Um, what are your thoughts on edibles there? Well, um, well, on the first point about, the, about getting, you know, with kids and stuff, I think, you know, look, drug dealers don't card. And, and so by moving this into a regulated market, we're going to do a better job. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as edibles go, yeah, I think it's a really about public education. Um, I think that people are, um, uh, they think, you know, pot's fun and da, 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 and they take a couple things and then it's good and then they start getting hungry and they eat more or yeah, whatever, yeah. right? I mean, everyone's got a story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, just like and, alcohol. Yeah. yeah. Three glasses and of I, wine, I did a shot and then I don't remember the other five <laughs> shots. Right. right. I mean, luckily with this you're not talking about, you know, no one's going to die. This no, is not, has anybody you know, died from the no. consumption of, overconsumption of marijuana? No. no. How many people die? I'll ask Gina, look, producer Gina, look up in the chat room. I'm wondering how many people die from the consumption of alcohol. So, and a I'm few not talking. hundred thousand a year. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yeah. It's that high? Yeah. Because it does seem to me like, you know, with, and now I'm not talking about you drank a bunch or you ate a bunch of medical marijuana and then, or cannabis. You know, and then you flipped your car, or you jumped off a building, right. or you got in a yeah. fight, or that, that's like you did some behavior. I'm talking about just from the consumption of the yeah. product. Nobody has no. ever OD'd from eating the gummy bears. So. Right. Yeah, and, and what and, happens if you eat so much marijuana? Like, what is the edge case of if you, you know, ate every pot brownie? What happens? You would sleep a lot. You'd sleep and, a lot. Or, or you make it paranoid, or right. yeah, or yeah. some some other sort of thing like that. Um, it won't. It's not pleasant. Right. It can't. It might not be a pleasant experience. Yeah, right. You, you exactly. still want to dose properly. And one of the things when we talk about um, altered driving um, is that to consider the fact that the problem with alcohol isn't that it impairs you. It's that it impairs you, and you, yet you're 100 percent confident in your skills. Yes. Ah. Right. When it emboldens consume, you. Right. Yeah. When people consume cannabis, it may alter them. Obviously, in most cases, much less than alcohol. But it doesn't. It, it, if anything, it makes them more careful about about whether or not they're okay to drive. And so I just feel like it's a, um, we, we obviously want to uh, be opposed to, to, to driving under the influence and want people to be careful about that. Uh, and uh, I just think in terms of potential social harm, I think that there are sort of self, um, you know, there's some sort of you know self-policing that occurs just because the product doesn't lead people to be like, woo! Yeah, it does, I mean, if you were, dealing with criminals and you put them on marijuana, you know, based on my, uh, you know, observations, <laughs> I think they would just watch a whole bunch yeah. of like That's right. Chappelle show. There was, a, <laughs> there was a story on that exact thing. And I believe it was in Sweden. They're, they're now, uh, or, uh, yeah, I forget what the country is. It's, it's in, it's there, it's around that area where they are, um, uh, giving cannabis to, uh, prisoners for that very reason. Interesting. We have a couple million people in jail right now. A lot of them for cannabis. What happens in society if 
these people have been put in jail for decades over something that is now legal. What should happen, AJ, and what do you think will happen? Look in your 10-year crystal ball. If this is completely legal, as you say, in 10 years, or as Troy says in 2018, what do we do in 2025 when we have people in jail for decades on you know, selling the marijuana that's now available at Starbucks or at Whole Foods. Right. Well, first, we want to be careful with the percentages of people that are incarcerated for marijuana, because right. those that are incarcerated for low personal amounts is, is almost zero. Ah. Um, I, I can't give you the exact numbers. Maybe it's two or three percent. Maybe you'd know of who's in, who, who are in for marijuana related charges. But mm -hmm. these are guys bringing in tons of bricks. Right. You know, from Mexico. Right. Those guys should be in jail. Right. They should be in jail. You believe they should be in jail? I believe they should be in jail. Yeah. Um, but if it, if there's someone who was busted for growing a bunch of plants because he's got cancer or, or you know, or he's just consuming in his home, I don't, th I don't think the government should be in there at all. Mm -hmm. How many people, uh, right now you said on a percentage basis, 6% of Americans have used it in the last two months? That was a normal study. That yeah, was the, I mean, yeah. the, You never know what these you never things, know. right? Yeah. Right. So it's a self-reporting, obviously. Yeah. Right. What do we think it will be in... Um, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, Troy? I don't think it increases all that much. Really? Um, I think it increases a little bit, um, but I don't think it increases that much. Why not? Because I disagree on this issue. Why okay. do you think it doesn't increase? <laughs> what will it be? Well, because I work in this field, right, I wind up talking to people a lot. Mm -hmm. And most people, even people who have a lot of exposure to cannabis, don't like it. Oh, they just, they, they, they just don't, don't like it. They like tried they, some it people on, don't drink vodka. Yeah, I've done it, and I don't like it. Or it's, it's not just my not, thing. It's not my thing, yeah. right? It, I don't think this... Th th yeah, I just don't think it, it, you know, people either like it or they don't like so it. So it could tick yeah. up from 6% to... 10%, something okay. like that, what or, do you or think, maybe AJ? less, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of in agreement. I mean, half of my employees don't use cannabis at all. Yeah. They just right. don't. Um, someone like me may be a good example. Uh, I, I used to enjoy a couple of cocktails at the end of the day, drink yep. some whiskey. Now I smoke weed every day, right. but it takes me a week to get through a joint. But what I do is I take two puffs and I feel relaxed. I don't feel crappy in the morning. Right. I can still focus on what I'm doing. It calms the mind, calms the body, and I, and that's the way I'm using it. And I think I think the percentage will. Were you go replacing up. something? Like were you on an anti-anxiety? If I may ask, like did you replace something, or is it just out? You just replaced alcohol. Was it like an anti-anxiety thing for you? It, it, well, anti-anxiety, but kind of just to settle the mind at the end of the day. Like like I think tons of people do. You come home, you pour yourself. I like, mean, yeah, that was the whole marketing yeah. of liquor in the United States of was, course. hey, come home and pour a couple. Right. And I didn't want to do that anymore. I think you, so what do you, what percentage do you think it will get to? Six, if we say six is the baseline, what do you think? Ten, uh, you agree with Troy or I more? Think, I think ten, and that's probably on the high side. I don't think it changes all that much. I think six yeah. to ten is right. I think you guys are wrong. Right. Respectfully, I know you know a lot more about this. I think it's going to go to 20%, 30%. I hope you're right. I'll tell you why. <laughs> and this is why I'm fascinated with it. Because having moved here from New York, where like, you know, like, if somebody smoked a joint, it was like, whoa, you had to go hide or something like that. Then I moved to L.A., and this is even six or seven years ago, not, you know, now, forget it. But people would smoke on the deck outside, and the bouncer would be near them, and it was kind of like, don't put it in the bouncer's face, but, you know, at the bar or whatever, but just don't, it was okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you go to dinner parties in L.A. with very famous people, or very, it's very normal for somebody to take out one of these... Um, the oil things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what are the, what, o open what, vape is one of them. But yeah, but what is the yeah. oil called? And is that good for you or not? Like, I, that one concerns me a little bit. What uh, is CO, it? That's usually CO2 extracted oil that goes in the, ah. um, in the if it's like an e-cigarette. If it's one of the ones where like it, it really heats up and you get some smoke out of it, that sometimes can be diff made from different things. Yeah. Because I see people using those now, and those are super like discreet, and nobody knows. Like I play in a poker game where guys um, smoke those like with, oil that smells like vanilla or yeah. purple mm -hmm. and trust me they don't want to be smoking thc during right. a poker game is right. not exactly right. a, a recipe for success although if you do smoke weed and like to gamble large sums of money playing <laughs> poker you are invited to my game <laughs> by all means if you're worth a billion dollars and you like to play high stakes poker and smoke weed we have a seat for you at the game but <laughs> nobody knows so what i think is going to happen with this is i think this becomes not only a replacement for alcohol uh and wine, like people will be pairing it with wine and chocolate, yeah, and yeah. it's going to become so normal that if you went to a concert, like there was just a concert series that was being paired with different strains, like I think it's going to become as acceptable as pairing wine. Yeah, it, and it, it, it could, could very well be that we go to a restaurant and there's a wine pairing and a THC pairing, a, yeah. you know, a cannabis pairing, and this could be a very refined restaurant where. You know, yeah, you're paying a hundred dollar prefix. I still think a real a real minority will still will will want to do it. Yeah, uh, I, but but I could be wrong. You're both I, wrong. Both hundred. I, I can wrong. tell you right now. <laughs> I want you to I be was right. right about Bitcoin, and I'll be right about this. Uh, yep. Mark my words. This will become uh, the 
um, you know, what do you call it before? Like just a decompression, the wind down mm-hmm. uh, accessory of choice for most Americans, not alcohol in our lifetime. Well, That's if, what if I believe. If that were to happen, there would, the social value of that would be massive. If it people were making that replacement, I mean, the, the reduction in social costs would be Absolutely. amazing. I mean, yeah, violence, domestic violence, depression, all yeah. this stuff is so correlated with alcohol, yep. and it just absolutely just destroys people's bodies that it would, if you could, there was an interesting Freakonomics radio show, I don't know if you heard it, but they were talking about if you could make alcohol, if alcohol wasn't legal today, and you were to make, and weed and cannabis and alcohol came out at the same time, which oh, yeah. one would society embrace? Yeah, cannabis, of it's course. It's pretty clear that they yeah. would embrace, you know, cannabis, not this incredible liver destroying alcohol. It's mm-hmm. a pub- I think I think alcohol is a public health problem. I really mm-hmm. do. Um, but I'm this on this point of the um, cannabis and you know whether it's better or worse and everything. It's important to point out that I'm not in this because I love cannabis. I'm in this because I love freedom and I love enterprise. And the thought that anyone would be punished for this plant makes my stomach turn. And that's why I got involved in this. And I realized that business is the most powerful platform the world has ever seen for political change. Mm -hmm. And so as we build this business, we're changing laws and we're changing minds. And, you know, the people that are sitting in prison, and I, I would disagree with 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 your assessment i think there are really a lot of really good people sitting in prison but more importantly than people well, that are sitting in prison do you think the person prison, who illegally brought in like a boatload of marijuana should be pardoned at some point because they were breaking the law in a major way, and you don't know if that was going to kids or I, I think people as long were as, murdered. In I it. think as long as it was nonviolent and there's not violence yeah. associated okay. with it, then yeah, I think it would be reasonable to let them out. But I think the larger question is that we have a whole society that lives in fear. I mean, how many people are like to consume cannabis, and then they're afraid they're going to lose their kids, or they're going to lose their job, or they're going to lose that? That's the kind of stuff that just pervades the society in a way that's really bad and that we can solve by ending this. I mean, when you saw those big numbers coming out of Colorado, I don't think people were buying cannabis that first month. I think they were buying freedom. I think they wanted the experience of freedom. Yeah, you did see freedom. that. Yeah, the first guy who bought it was a vet who was dealing with yeah. PTSD, and it was quite touching that he was like, yeah. listen, I, you know, I, I, I saw bad things, and I'm yeah. trying to get my anxiety down, and this happens to be the best drug to do that, right. as opposed to the other prescriptions I have. What do you think the ongoing influence of the cartels will be? AJ, you have any thoughts on that? No. What happens to cartels? The cartels have to go away. Um, I, they, or move into another category. Which they've already started to do. Oh, I have mean, they? Uh, from, you know, it's all anecdotal. Of from course. What, from what I understand, in Colorado, the cartels are backing off marijuana a little bit. Yeah. And, and bringing in some other other substances. I don't know that for a fact. I don't have any cartel connections. No, I mean, it's not <laughs> like this is a, this is somebody doing statistics on this. But. Right. But, I mean, it... For compla- comparing the cartels to a rum runner during prohibition is really the same thing. You make it legal, and he has to f- he has to go away or figure out a different way. Yeah, they're going to move into gambling or, or prostitution mm-hmm. or cocaine or whatever. Yeah, and it's also just a it's you know I mean it, if you look at economics, it's not it's not that it just gets displaced. They don't find necessarily another thing. I mean that's how jobs shift around, right? We're taking you're taking profits away from cartels. That's a good thing, yeah. right? These uh, these cartels are destabilizing entire countries. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the murders in 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 Mexico and other places. It really I mean, is. It's, Mexico it's, it's, is it's, suffering. The blood is on our hands if yeah, we don't Mexico change these suffering. laws. Mexico is suffering because of our habit. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, was it's actually unconscionable. I was, I was meeting with uh, Vicente Fox, former president of Mexico, uh, not too long ago, who is now championing marijuana legalization uh, in Mexico uh, and in the U.S. Let me ask you about these entrepreneurs, these founders. Yeah. Are they like legit entrepreneurs that I would see at like the launch festival and like of the caliber that you see on my program? Or are some of them kind of stoners with like a crazy idea? Like where, how has that changed over the years? Because I know like a lot of these products were like, I would never invest in the company. But if I came, do you think I would be actually like impressed by some of these founders or not? Well, you should come. I will come. June 23rd, we're going to be in uh, uh, Denver at the Denver Center Ah, for the Performing Arts. I don't know if I can make that because i got to be in New York. But I I will commit to coming to one of these because I do think like there's nothing wrong with it. And I do think it's going to be like a a big business. But back to my question, are they legit or not? Yeah. So when we first started, if you could complete a sentence, we'd put you on stage. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's very honest of you. This is two or three years ago. Yeah. Um, And there there wasn't much to choose from, right? right. And uh, slowly but surely, the quality is getting better and better and better. And 
the and now we're starting to see a lot of people from Silicon Valley start to really take a look mm. at this because you know I mean do we really need a you know another app where you trade shoes or another like you know I mean how many more sort of social networking things can we possibly build before we scrape the bottom of the barrel there's so much low hanging fruit in this sector mm -hmm. that the best minds of our generation have yet not really put their minds to this yet. It's right. a wide open field. We'd love to hear from people who are uh, that that caliber coming in. And we're also starting to see that. Mm. Um, but one of the challenges that most founding teams have in this space is finding people who are both have a lot of cannabis knowledge and also have a lot of business knowledge right. is often a tough team to find. You either it have It might one be negatively correlated. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not just about like being a cannabis consumer, right? right? Lots of cannabis consumers, but but if you actually understand the industry or you understand the cultivation or you understand the buyers mm. and sellers Got in this it. space, that's where you yeah, tend not, to... Yeah, not the uh, yeah. consumption of the product, but the actual manufacturing distribution and those kind of issues. And that's starting to, that's starting to change. Yeah, and that's our challenge as well. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons you guys did really well yeah. at ArcView because you, you, you had, we were able to have both... Both knowledges, right? Both pieces of knowledge. What's, kind of. Without giving too many details, AJ, what's the scale of your business now? Is it hundreds of drivers, dozens of drivers? Um, we're a staff of 32, 28 drivers. Our patient base wow. is 18. I think we just crossed 19,000. Wow. So we are the largest of our kind. I can't give revenue numbers, but we do. No. We do well. Yeah. And um, uh, people sustainable. ask. Sustainable. Sustainable. Uh, we don't have any recognizable competition. While there are uh, tons of services in the city, no one's really operating at our scale. Interesting. And that's through technology. That's through technology and marketing. So what will your business look like if all this becomes legal 10 years from now? What's your hope for, for speedweed.com? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd be on the beach house in six years, so I'd have to, <laughs> so I'd have to check so in. So a huge exit. But what would, the, what would the profile of the business be if this becomes legal in 2018, as Troy has said? You know, we're, we're a medical marijuana company. However, we still want to position ourselves as still a viable business when recreational becomes fully legal. Mm -hmm. So we would love to see um, ProVersion lifted and then be either a, a partial or full acquisition target from a larger company, mm. uh, perhaps an IPO sometime down the road. Yeah. That's kind of our exit strategy. And how many cities do you think you'll be operating in? I mean, it's, In 10 years? Yeah. Well, we would Dozens? Want to, we want to be in all, all the major, every major market, yeah. How hard is it to set this operation up? I mean, you got to spend a half million dollars on legal expenses to get through the red tape. That's that's the the biggest challenge for our business because as a startup, you already have the a set of challenges. Now with us, we have to have a second set of lawyers, a second set of accountants, um, advising uh, us on the very industry specific laws. How do people pay taxes on marijuana, Troy? Because in some cases, like people didn't know how to pay them if, if I read correctly, um, and, and that may be, that information is probably old, but I had read that people who were doing it were like, okay, we're legal, sort of, but the federal government, how do they actually go pay their taxes? Because that's the thing that gets people tripped up is not paying taxes. Right. So what do they do? They just send it in and say, like, we created this and yeah, well, pray? Yeah, that's that's exactly. I mean, they, they, send, they send them in, and then one of the things that's happening is that the IRS is using this antiquated rule called 280E, uh, which was basically a, a, a thing that basically was like, if you're a if you're a, a, a kingpin, right, you still owe taxes on your on your stuff. And, the Al Capone and, clause, right? And they, yeah, essentially, and uh, and so they're trying to use that on regulated businesses. Wow. And it, so it's causing the tax rates for the businesses that actually touch cannabis to be exceedingly high. They are paying federal taxes, but they're paying them high because they're unable to um, uh, deduct their their normal. Uh, and ordinary business expenses that you would have in other companies. Is there a fear, though, if you pay your taxes, then you're going to trigger an investigation or something like that? Or was that no, previously I, I, the fear? No, that now? previously was the fear. Now the fear would would be would be the would be the opposite. I think I think, and also with all the regulations and everything, I, it would be crazy. How for much a of this is Obama? Do, do you think AJ? Because he seems to. I this is what I heard from an insider. Yep. Because I asked my friend who was an insider, and he's and he said to me, in the second term. He's going to make. He's going to solve all these problems. He's going to, you know, get pull the feds back. But in the first term, he wants to get elected again, so he doesn't want to lose people. So right. he's incredibly strategic, but he's absolutely pro, you know, uh, legalization and recreational use. How big of an impact has Obama been, and what do you think about that inside information I had? I agree with that analysis. I mean, he had to position himself at least, if not tough on crime, as someone who's aware that crime is a problem in, in, in order to expand his base. I understand that. Um, we look more at what Holder's doing. Uh, we believe in Obama's heart. He doesn't care about any of this. We believe that. Yeah. Um, but what comes out of the DOJ? The, the attorney. Attorney. Oh, no, 
the attorney general, right? Attorney Holder, general, right. Yeah. So, so what comes out of the, out Holder, of the, the attorney Holder. general? Holder, yeah. So what comes out of the DOJ affects us very of justice, yeah. v directly, and we have to watch what he does, specifically with banking laws. And what has his position been? Because he's kind of new. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he agrees with Obama. However, about two years ago, he told the banking industry, if you work with a marijuana business, we're going to get you on RICO laws Whoa. and racketeering. And they said, OK, we're done. And then about three, four, five months ago, he said, uh, you know, never mind. Now you can work with marijuana businesses. And the big banks just are afraid to dip their toe back in that water. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Eric, Eric Holder's been attorney general for a while, but he changed. He flip-flopped his position mm -hmm. a little bit. Or he just evolved it. I shouldn't evolved. say flip evolved. It evolved. He evolved it, which along with Obama's evolving position on things. It's very interesting with Obama. Like he was, you know, anti-gay marriage and he evolved. He was mm -hmm. anti, you know, legalization and he evolved. Yeah. It's very interesting how you evolve when you get that second term mm -hmm. under your belt. No judgments. I think it's a brilliant <laughs> Frankly, I think it's a brilliant strategy. You duped mm -hmm. all the dopes on the right into thinking like you were with them. And then he's like, oh, yeah, by the way. I mean, I think it's good. when he writes a biography. Mm -hmm. A third it, biography. Yeah. yeah right, <laughs> I mean, right, when he right, writes right. the post presidential biography, is going to be awesome because he'd be just like, hey, listen, suckers. Right. I just played you. I, you got me into office that second time, and then I revealed exactly how I feel about these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Uh, the critics say, hey, this is a gateway drug. Oh my God, it's a gateway drug. Do you guys think this leads to other drugs being either decriminalized or not? Specifically, MDMA, uh, Molly, mm -hmm. ecstasy, uh, cocaine, LSD, mushrooms. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, the public clearly knows the difference between cannabis and other drugs. If you look at the polling, it's very clear. The public supports legalizing marijuana. It does not support legalizing the other drugs. So I don't think it leads to anything. Mm. Um, but I personally don't believe in drug prohibition, and I particularly believe really strongly uh, in the uh, therapeutic uh, careful use of psychedelics. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's... Uh, I, so you would I be okay under what circumstances with, say, the, the psychedelics, LSD, uh, mushrooms, ecstasy, MDMA, if you, if a pharmaceutical company could make those and mm -hmm. distribute them um, with a prescription or something yeah. from a doctor, you'd be okay with that? Yeah, I think in controlled settings. There's actually ah. an organization I used to work for called the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and they're doing, uh, you know, approved research all around the country uh, oh, wow. with with MDMA for PTSD. Uh, could be a massive. They say MDMA yeah. was started for couples therapy, exactly. and then they exactly said it's right. one of the most effective for PTSD. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it, AJ? Do you think those should be legalized? I agree. MDMA started out as a pharmaceutical, a, a low dose yeah. pharmaceutical, and it became illegal because the formula got out and they started overdosing on it and getting high mm. but it wasn't used for that it was used so psychiatrists can just get their patients to open up a little bit more mm -hmm. and, huh. help, and yeah help but I don't think we should ever be I don't think we should be making things legal because they're harmless I think we should be making things legal because prohibition doesn't work because prohibition ah, increases so you're a the harms about this. Yeah. because prohibition increases the harms associated with anything right right I, you know, I, if you put something in the criminal market, then what you have is both the challenges that come with that drug and the challenges that come with a criminal market that, that distributes it, uh, and then you have public health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really think that, that, that we need to find other solutions. I don't think everything should be on a shelf in 7-Eleven, mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, right? In 7 -11, yeah. no. right? I, I don't believe in that. You're I think probably not a great idea about to have controlled LS, ways LSD to at the things. airport, LAX. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll take a... I'll take a <laughs> You know, a latte and a tab of LSD, and then get on my 16-hour yeah. flight to Australia. <laughs> exactly. Not a not a great combo. <laughs> um, but I mean, you do see this horrible thing where people um, at these electronic music festivals. I think we had two people die at them from ODing on uh, ecstasy. If cannabis was legal uh, for recreational use, and they had it at Coachella or this electron, maybe these kids would just like eat a brownie to like dance all night, as opposed to taking six, six or seven hits of ecstasy, dehydrating, losing their minds, and dying. Well, that's it. Yeah, well, sure. exactly. And the problem is that cannabis is the loudest in terms of like it's, it's like you know it's the most detectable. It stays mm -hmm. in your body the longest. Yeah. It's like the 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 safest and most uh, you know uh, uh, easy on the on the body uh, um, substance that people like to enjoy. 
is the one that's the loudest. And so it really does, you know, we're driving people to drink and we're driving people to do other things that are more dangerous because yeah. we're th this thing is, is you know, because we're punishing people for making a safer choice. Mm -hmm. All right, listen, I really appreciate you both coming on the program. Troy Dayton is with the ARC View, view Group. ARC View Group, and you can find the ARC View Group at arcviewgroup.com? You can. Okay, and then on Twitter, Troy is T. Dazzy. T Dazzle. T Dazzle. That's with my, no my, e. my it's my Burning Man name. Wow. T Dazzle. <laughs> I didn't know you were gonna say my Twitter T -D -A -Z -Z -L. name. T D A Z Z L. I never T Dazzle that. in the Hizzy. That's Jesus Troy. Wow. You, you look you, you just you seem so like buttoned up and now we have to picture you like in a sarong at Burning Man. Yeah. As T Dazzle. Yeah. Well, I also I write Are a they... I write a blog at burnerlove.com if you want to okay, check yeah. that out. Okay. Burner Love. Uh, I write about other things besides uh All right, besides T... cannabis. Okay, T Dazzler. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, and AJ Gentile uh, is with, of course, Speedweed at LA Speedweed uh, on Twitter yep. and Speedweed.com, founded in 2011. Um, and you know. Uh, Great success to you. I hope that this all works out for you guys. Um, and I hope the ArcLight uh, group, Arc Arc View, view group. group, sorry, ArcLight <laughs> is a movie chain here. The ArcView group does great at this. Hundreds of millions of dollars in funds are being raised. It's kind of interesting. It's remarkable. That's why, and that's why I'm sort of interested in it here is the technology of it and the business opportunity. And I mean, it's only like once, I mean, it's just phenomenal to me on an individual basis to grow up now, I'm 43, and have spent these 30 years hearing people, you know, talk about like, you know, going to jail for this stuff, and now this whole change in our lifetime is just phenomenal yeah. to see. So, um, I think this, this, like I said, I think this is going to be like our Bitcoin episode where everybody's going to be like, Yeah, of course, you know. But uh, when we did the Bitcoin episode, people were like, What? Um, great job, and thanks to our sponsors uh, for helping me put together this amazing show. You know, I got, I just want to thank my sponsors for one minute. They're very brave, they support me. I take a lot of risks, as you know, with the show taking on challenging topics. I'm an outspoken person, and at times, like, hey, listen, sometimes I'm outspoken, and as I say the wrong thing, or I make a mistake, or whatever it is, and sometimes I'm outspoken, and we have, like, brilliant moments on the show. It's part of doing a show. It's part of having conversations. So sometimes I'm going to hit it. Sometimes I'll make a mistake. But thanks so much for you guys, all my sponsors over the years, five years of doing this, for supporting me um, do this show, doing this show to really showcase entrepreneurs and, and the world and products getting making the world better uh, and all the hard decisions that we're dealing with as a society. We're all in this together. And just thank you to all those great sponsors who support us. Thank you, producer Gina. Um, Jacob doing a great job. We miss you, Brandis, but boy, Jacob's doing a great job as well. It's a big shoes to fill, and he's doing a great job. Thank you, uh, of course, Andrew on the launch ticker. If you don't get the launch ticker, go to at launch ticker on Twitter or launch ticker, or just go to launch.co. Uh, Jade and Emily, you have the events on lockdown. Thank you for that. And sales, my God, Luke, Brandon, and DeMont are crushing it. I'm at Jason. This is This Week in Startups, and we'll see you next time.